The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. King Herod heard of Jesus and his disciples, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason, these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? She replied, the head of John the baptizer. Immediately, she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved Yet out of his regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Well, what are we going to do with that one? Sort of no getting around, getting around the bush today. Um, so here we go. John the Baptist has um, always gets a bad rap, in my opinion. I guess he kind of always has. He remains there out on the fringe in his camel skin, yelling into the canyon, always on edge with his message of repent. Remember Charlton Heston out in the wilderness? Repent. He is the forerunner who dines on locusts and wild honey and speaks of fire and axes at the bases of trees. We only hear from John a couple times during the church's year of grace, and for many of us, that's okay, right? I mean, who could forget, you brood of vipers, and not do some serious self-reflection? The fact that we get that right before Christmas is not lost on me. I mean, I think that's Advent, right? Today, however, John wasn't out in the canyon on some distant riverbed. He was in the court of a king. And he was bringing to mind the commandments of God. And depending on the Pharaoh, such things don't always bode well. I confess I've been thinking a lot about John the Baptist um, after hearing a 
a very wonderful lecture on him from our own Mark Wright. After Mark's cogent remarks concerning the man of the hour, um, I went looking for the icon of John the Baptist that he mentioned, the one on their front cover that bears John with wings. I had heard of some interesting depictions of John before, but mostly those were centered on his um, less than desirable wardrobe choices or the fact that he was always carrying his head around on a platter. But I had never heard of John with wings before. And let's face it, I mean, if you get wings, that's pretty cool. In Christian art, wings are symbols of divine mission. That's why the angels, the archangels, the cherubim, and the seraphim have them. They are the messengers of God. One just has to think of that, that wonderful Advent hymn, the angel Gabriel from heaven came with wings as drifted snow and with eyes as a flame. In addition to angels, we have the emblems on the front cover of the gospel book. I need to reference this because I forgot what it was called, but it, the tetramorph. You have Jesus in the center and then you have an image of a man with wings for St. Matthew, a lion with wings for St. Mark, an ox with wings for St. Luke. If you go down to Metcalf Hall, you'll see a winged ox. And then the eagle for St. John, all with wings. As far as I know, which isn't much, um, John is the only human in the gospel that ends up with a pair of wings. John is the messenger, the forerunner of Jesus, right? I think we are to think so. And so when I think about him, I think about John's dad. Zechariah. You remember the song that Zechariah sings? It's beautiful. We say it in morning prayer sometimes. And Zechariah sings this right after his, his tongue becomes loosened, like his tongue, he can speak again in the beginning of Luke. Zechariah sings, you, my child, should be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his way. And this is the message, right? To give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. And there is John's message. Repent. But Zechariah goes on. He says, in the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. It's beautiful. Breathtaking, really, if you think about that Zechariah is now able to talk and that he's singing this on the eighth day after his son's birth as his son is handed over to the rabbis or the priests where he's being circumcised, given over to the Lord, as it were. But an odd little word right after that sticks out like a sore thumb for me. And it's where Luke writes, fear came over all of their neighbors. And all these things were talked about throughout the entire hill country of Judea. And all those who heard those words pondered them and said, what then shall this child become? And so with the future unwritten, Luke writes, 
for indeed the hand of the Lord was with him. The child grew and became strong in spirit. And he was in the wilderness until the day he appeared publicly to Israel. Or in other words, until he appeared before the power that was Israel. It's a rather curious phrase, right? Fear coming in right after this beautiful birth story. And whatever the case may be, we can be sure of the dichotomy that is cast at the advent of John's birth. Fear, whether in a profound sense of respect or dread, like he can come back from the dead, dread, will follow John all the days of his life. And his life will not be easy, especially when it meets us here today. I realize that the world of Herod and his court may be foreign to most of us. I mean, it still is to me. Josephus is pretty boring. <laughs> I suspect, however, that we very much know that there can often be a destructive and dark side to the dynamics of sex and power. One that unfortunately remains a very real feature of human life today. This is where I wanna tread a little carefully. And though the use of sexual attractiveness to gain access to that power is front and center here, how it operates within the entire context of the Bible, right? Should not blind us to what is really happening in this scene. It's a common enough element throughout the Bible. I mean, just go back to Genesis and think about Abraham and Sarah, right? Abraham's going down to Egypt, looks at his wife and says, hey, you're my sister, okay? You remember that? Morally, it's hard for us to get past such scandals, whether we're talking about Jezebel's or Judith's. And hear me, please, I'm not saying that we shouldn't stop there and do some serious reflection on how times have changed or not. What I am saying is that in addition to that work, the legend of John the Baptist ultimately reveals something deeper and nebulous about the sometimes very dangerous and urgent work of the kingdom. It does this almost in spite of a particular sexual ethic and even morality. But don't shoot the messenger, okay? It's ironic to say such things, especially when given a less than flattering example with which to deal with. And so I go back to John's daddy. especially that bit about peace. And I realize, as I think you do, just as you have seen it and felt it in your own life, that peacemaking is hard work. For peacemaking involves truth-telling. And if you find yourselves giving away half of your kingdom because of some self-centeredness or selfishness, you probably don't want to hear the truth because... The truth often breaks the spell of delusion. And when you break the powers of spells in your life, great weights begin to shift around. The ethics of control and risk often find themselves in flux and in tragic cases such as John's case, Justice becomes the ultimate victim. And so as you hear this story and you work with it throughout this week, 
how we make sure that that doesn't happen in our lives should be evident. Although how it equips us to do the work we must do may look different to each of us. For me in the work I do, it sheds light on the decisions where sacrifice is involved. By using the legend of the righteous Persian in a wicked courtroom, the gospel alerts us to the dangers that await those who challenge power. And by extension, what ultimately awaits Jesus as he challenges both powers that are natural and supernatural in his own life. Herod recognizes in some sense that Jesus is the successor of John the Baptist. Yet repentance, a message that John has preached so often, does not accompany Herod's statement. And we as hearers of this story are to understand that the murderous scene may be repeated if Jesus runs afoul of the authorities in his world. This tale, though rather unpleasant, provides us all the means we need to examine the ways in which compromise is leveraged or degrees of differentiation are rationalized in order to separate the king from the responsibility of John the Baptist's death. Nevertheless, as in the case of Pilate in a few chapters, such attempts to shift blame onto others are not entirely persuasive. One just has to think of Pilate washing his hands, right? The truth is, the Herod thinks more of his drunken oaths that he has sworn and his honor before the assembled guests than he does about the prophet whom he was allegedly protecting. And the willingness to sacrifice others to maintain honor, prestige, or power remains one of the greatest temptations of persons in positions of authority. And so the lessons abound for us. But perhaps one lesson we might consider, given the fact that what we all seek to do as minister in Christ's name, should begin with a question. For whom do we not serve to protect than those Christ came to serve? Even when sometimes those who we serve to protect challenge us. I suspect that off with their heads in any manifestation is judged according to the powers of this world and not God's.